grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also, and also with you. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that you have again brought us together on the Lord's day to praise you for your goodness and to ask your blessing. Give us grace to see your hand in the week that is past and your purpose in the week to come. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome everyone and good morning. And uh, it's wonderful to see you all here as we gather and offer our online worship uh, for the communities of St. Augustine of Canterbury, St. James Westminster, uh, no. Par no, not St. James Westminster, St. James <laughs> Roseland. That makes more sense. Thank you. Uh, so I'll start again. St. Augustine of Canterbury, St. James Roseland, the Parish of Southern Trinity, which is, includes uh, St. Andrews and Harrow, and Christ Church in Colchester, and All Saints Anglican Church in downtown Windsor. Uh, joining us this morning are the Reverend Elise Chambers and the Reverend Charlotte Malaf. Reverend Robert is missing this morning, um, and we pray for his convalescence as he recovers from some surgery that he had this last week, and uh, hope that all is going well with him as uh, we continue our ministries together. I think we so, could probably share that we have spoken with him. It has gone well so far, yes. And uh, he seems to be recovering. Seems to be recovering well, exactly. Uh, but welcome this morning. It's great to have you here. Hopefully you've had a chance to download or print your service booklet as we make our way through our worship service this morning. Just to get us all started, why don't you join us as we offer our opening hymn number 503 in your blue common praise hymnal or in your song sheet, Fight the Good Fight with All My Might. Dear friends in Christ, as we turn our hearts and minds to worship Almighty God, let us confess our sins. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against you in thought, thought word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the, For the sake, sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful God, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
My friends, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Our act of praise this morning is in your, in your song sheet. Father, I adore you. As we approach the second verse of this hymn, you're going to be invited to join in singing it around. As we sing the second verses around, um, after the first line, you can join uh, myself. Uh, Charlotte will get us started, and I will kick in with the round on the second verse. So, Father, I adore you in your song sheet.
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament pro proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its, its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, joining the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fi fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As, As it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading this morning comes to us from Paul's letter to the Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our gradual song this morning is in your song sheet, the Cares Chorus.
So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This is the Lord's doing, and it, it, it is amazing in your eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard these parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. This morning, instead of our typical sermon conversation or sermons that go sort of in a, a cycle of any sort, uh, we want to take a moment and take you back about a week, um, a week ago yesterday, actually, back to a synod that took place online, a virtual synod that happened uh, sourced from St. Paul's Cathedral in downtown London and sent out across the diocese through Zoom and Facebook and other uh, online sources. In the midst of that, that experience, that synod experience, uh, our bishop, Todd Townsend, was able to share with us his charge, his vision of, for uh, the Diocese of Huron for the coming little while as he begins his Episcopal ministry. And we wanted to take the time to share that ministry or share that vision uh, with the gathering community that gathers online. So uh, we're going to pause for a moment here and we're going to go to the video that was recorded of Bishop Todd's uh, charge to synod. Spliced a little bit here and there just so that it's, uh, it fits a little bit better into our worship time this morning. Um, but we're going to take a pause and we're going to go and hear the words of Bishop Todd as he lays out a vision for the diocese in his first charge to synod at our diocesan synod this last week. We're now going to begin um, the Bishop's Charge, which will be in, in three parts. And the, the title of it is the, th is the theme of our Synod, Living Hope, Our Identity and Mission in Christ. And in what follows, I'm not going to say anything that you don't already know. Uh, we know who to be and what to do. I'm just trying to remember out loud and focus some of the things that over the years we have continually said amen to. I also have a premise that sort of lies underneath all of this, and that uh, should be articulated. I believe that the world, that society needs what we do, needs hope, needs grace, needs gospel. We have a tremendous impact and have had on our society and continue to have, must continue to have. And it comes in a variety of ways. I read recently that religious communities uh, have a $67 billion 
dollar economic impact per year in Canada alone. 67 billion. That's incredible value. But by any measure uh, in the measures of grace, that's a tiny thing. What God does through us is not measurable in those terms. The world needs us to be a peaceful community where beauty, truth, hospitality, mutual respect, vulnerability, trust, goodness, and the bearing of one another's burdens are prized and are allowed to flourish. We're a community that can walk through the world with more influence than 67 billionaires, much more and much better. But there is an edge to this premise, and that is the world, including all of us, needs both God's judgment and God's healing grace. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself because it was unreconciled. We benefit um, and participate in both of these things. And when we open ourselves, when we have the mind of Christ, when we empty ourselves in order to receive the gifts of God, this becomes possible. The stone and wood that creates a space in our churches is really just there so that there's this open and empty place into which we can come and into which we can invite God and God can act. So I'd like to start by answering the implied question in the theme for the Synod. Our identity is in Christ. Our mission is healing and reconciliation of the world to God. And in that, we are living hope. We are living hope for others, but we are also living out hope. So some work on vision and planning is timely. So today I will offer four areas of focus, and they may be our priorities for the next five to 10 years. But before we make any firm commitments, I'd like to hear your input and weave in your voices and your desires and your vision. We've set up a group to help with this and to work on strategy, resources, and impl implementation of these ideas. And the plan is to bring it back to May Synod in 2021 and or the special synod in the fall if it's necessary. And the vision advisory group we've assembled are a group of gifted people who will help keep us on track and help keep ears to the ground and bring wisdom to the conversation. They are Paul Townsend, one of the co-chairs of the coaches, uh, Marilyn Malton, Paul Rathbone, uh, Tim Dobbin, Osita Owebo, Paul Millward, Tanya Fibbs, and me. And this group will function as vision guides, consulting with various groups and individuals in the diocese between September 2020 now and May 2021. So that's a sketch of the process part of this. But as for the content of it, I think the Diocese of Huron, I believe the Diocese of Huron has an opportunity to embrace uh, the moment and have a strategic goal that can be described in a number of ways, but here's how I'll describe it. A goal for us would be to shift the center of gravity in our diocese from operations to renewal and new creation, better revealing the marks of mission by becoming a learning church, a just church, a diverse church, and a new church. The key to this will be to be open to God's desire for us and for the world. Jesus became entirely receptive to God and God's will for him in the world. And we have to have that same mind. Now, what do I mean by uh, shift in the center of gravity? One definition of this is that the center of gravity is the average location of the weight of an object. The average location of the weight of an object and the object tends to rotate around that point. In our object, the church, we tend to rotate around the work of making sure that the operation continues. 
it's efficient, that it's healthy. And how we operate and how we function uh, is very, very important. However, we can keep this machine running effectively and efficiently, but still fail to fulfill our primary mission. Especially this can happen, especially when circumstances have put us into survival mode. I, I'm only estimating, but I estimate that we spend over 80%, in some cases over 90% of our energy and resources just on keeping the operation going. And it's getting harder and harder to just operate. You know that. Some of this operation was set up under very different circumstances. Uh, what used to work really well doesn't work now. Some of it does, some of it doesn't. Anyone my age or older was trained to operate in a different environment. Uh, no wonder we're working harder and harder and getting fewer results. There is a, a paradox in our time, and it is that we live, when I'm speaking of we, I mean North America, Western Europe, the Western world, we live in a society uh, that is formed that is almost trained to resist what is proclaimed in the gospel. Um, that's always been true, but probably more now than ever. Yet we also live in a society that yearns for what God offers in this gospel and what is proclaimed in it more deeply than ever. So at the same time, no society has ever been more resistant to the truth of Jesus, and no society has ever yearned for that more. No society has ever felt this burden and this barrenness in the midst of so many riches and advancements. So the church has a challenge and an opportunity. And I think in our part of the world, the next 20 years really matter. But I have hope. I mean, I'm investing in it. This is what I plan to spend the rest of my life doing with all of you. And in this, I want to be really clear. I am, I'm not suggesting that we layer on more and more burdens and demands on ourselves by just trying harder and doing the same thing better and working harder and putting more in. We've tried that. No, I'm not suggesting that at all. We do not need to add any of what I'm talking about and that what I'm proposing on top of everything else, which means we will be letting go of some things. We will be letting go of some things. We need to keep operating, obviously, but only essential services. And do we really need to spend that much time and energy on it? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Can it be shared? We will need to be constantly stealing time away from operations, the running of the organization, making sure that it still runs in a healthy, godly way, but to take some of that time and spend some of that precious resource on growing and adapting and embracing a new environment for mission. Uh, this will take focus and commitment. It's easy to talk about it. It's much more challenging to do it. But I have some clear ideas and commitments about how we can at least try. So to begin, that's basically what I'm proposing we do over the next six or seven months that we that together we make a real commitment to focus on some new things and to streamline some other things. And the new things, fortunately, are not really new things. They're old things. They're, they're traditioned. They're, they've been passed on to us. And of all the streams of tradition, sometimes the church embraces just parts of it. We may be able to embrace and emphasize and commit to uh, parts of it that we have not needed or neglected in the past ancient attitudes and practices and habits for a new age. So for the rest of this afternoon, I'm going to outline uh, a renewed understanding of mission, and then I will suggest these four priorities for us to consider over the next six to 12 months. My hope is that by next May, in the fall at the latest, depending on COVID and other things, we can commit to some new way of being and get going that we can find a way to shift that center of gravity, that, that center of balance in our common life together to a new place. So let me speak a bit about mission. The focus on mission will continue. 
uh, you will be asked in, in your congregations to build on your existing mission and ministry plans, but also to become more aware of the shifts underneath uh, this in your ongoing life together locally. Uh, take a look at your plan. Where do these five, four priorities show up? How can you double down and strengthen your commitment to some of them? Uh, how can you release some time and energy to spend on these things? And, and, and take away the burden of guilt that we have sometimes uh, for not uh, doing other things. What is the local priority in the gospel? So mission and ministry plans will continue and they'll get a second look, uh, trying to see if they can gain more depth and focus. They seem, from what I can tell, to be helping about 50% of you, which is pretty good. Uh, they're about who we are and what we do, our identity and mission. So mission is still a very important word for us in this time. But the meaning of mission, as I've identified in a couple of things I've written since January, uh, the meaning of mission needs a, a, another look. Mission is not primarily a human activity. It's not in the church, in the life of the church, it's not primarily a human activity. God is carrying out God's mission among us, with us, for us and for the world. And our mission is only found in God's mission by understanding what God has done and is doing, but also what God will do. So our first task is to come to know and love this God and watch for what God might be up to. And then the marks of mission that we've so rightly focused on across the Anglican communion, the marks of mission are for me signs that we might be on the right track as participants in God's mission. They're marks, they reveal that, that we are participating in a way that is helpful in, mission, in God's mission. So I've reworded the marks of mission here a bit to emphasize that it's God's mission alive among us. I'm not changing the marks of mission, I'm just rewording them to show the emphasis shift. So for example, with the first mark, as we proclaim, as we proclaim the good news of the kingdom, God does this and that and the other thing. What, are, what is this and that and the other thing in your life together? What fruit comes of the proclamation of good news of the kingdom? We'll get better at describing that and recognizing it. The second one, as we teach, baptize, and nurture new believers, God does X, Y, and Z. Tell us what happens as you teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. As we respond to human need by loving service, God has an opening to do this. What does it look like where you are and in your life? What happens? As we seek to transform unjust structures of society and challenge violence of every kind and pursue peace and reconciliation, God acts in these ways, and we name them. As we strive to safeguard the integrity of creation, God sustains and renews the life of the earth. God doesn't do these things if we do them. God is free to accomplish whatever God wants. But God still wants, still seems to want to work through our lives. And that's a very good thing for us. So what about mission in the time of uh, COVID? I would say that our strategic work has only been intensified and clarified and accelerated by the pandemic. As I said earlier, the pandemic has been revelatory. It's revealed painful things. It's caused painful things, but it's also revealed opportunities. It's shifted us whether we wanted to or not in some ways. The elements of this time have created a sense of urgency that's both appropriate in some cases un unnecessary in others. This has been a period of church building outside of the church building. And this can continue in small groups for formation and prayer, and then in larger gatherings, uh, in new configurations sometimes, on adapted schedules sometimes, but the goal is still, is still to have a much more meaningful impact on the surrounding neighborhoods and communities. Recall that in order to be more open to God's desire for the world and for us, I'm asking that we shift the center of gravity in every congregation in the Diocese of Huron from operations to renewal and new creation. By better revealing, this will allow us to better reveal the marks of mission by becoming a learning church, just church, diverse church, and a new church.
My brothers and sisters, let us confess our faith as we say, I believe in God, the, the Father, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you as we enter into this time of prayer that you would find yourself able to focus on something that draws your attention to the needs of the people. As we share in the prayers of the people this morning accompanied by Jonathan on the keyboard. Holy Protector, you are the Lord our God who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Let us pray, responding to that all may know with, you are the Lord our God who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Today we pray for the release of those held captive by cruel governments and human traffickers by oppressive ideologies and suffocating theologies. We pray that all may know, You are the Lord our God, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. We pray for the release of those held captive by debilitating disease and mental illness, by crippling addiction and chronic fear. We pray now for all of those who are on our hearts and on our minds as we bring their names to you. We pray that all may know, You are the Lord our God, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. We pray for the release of those held captive by crushing grief and paralyzing memories, piercing loneliness and deadening hopelessness. We pray for all of those who are living on the streets of our cities and communities. We pray for those who struggle to find one moment to the next. We pray that all may know you are the Lord our God, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Release within us your divine compassion and care on behalf of those who suffer, that all may know that you are the Lord our God, who brought us into the land of promise, into the house of salvation, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Straining forward to what lies ahead, let us offer ourselves to God. Our offertory hymn this morning is in your hymn book number 435, or in your song sheet, Take My Life and Let It Be.
bride offers all that she is and all that she has to her bridegroom, so we offer ourselves to you, our heavenly bridegroom. May these offerings increase our joy and reflect your glory. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. May the love of the Creator who rescues us from slavery, the grace of the Savior who redeems us from brokenness, and the peace of the Spirit who moves us into freedom surround you, uphold you, and sustain you now and forevermore. Amen. So just a couple of quick announcements this morning as we uh, wrap up our worship. The uh, first thing that I'd like to mention is please make sure that you mark your calendars. Uh, we've set a date for Sunday the 18th of October. Uh, that's not next Sunday, which of course is Thanksgiving Sunday, but the Sunday after, uh, which will be our food drive. Um, so this will be our drive-through food drive that we've been doing for the last little while. Uh, we will continue to, uh, to offer that ministry and there will be more details coming out as far as where that food drive is going to be directed to. I know you heard a conversation a couple of weeks ago about where some possibilities are. Um, we are probably going to be uh, supporting Canterbury College uh, through their, uh, their um, food bank, uh, pardon me. Uh, but there's also going to be another piece to that uh, online food drive. I'm just going to just give a little bit of a teaser there, not give you all of the information um, as we prepare ourselves for what that might look like. But mark your calendars, Sunday, October the 18th, for our next drive-through food drive um, as we make our way through this continued uh, time of pandemic. Uh, the other thing I want to share with you is next Sunday is, of course, Thanksgiving Sunday. It's the uh, National Observance of Thanksgiving here in Canada. Um, and we will be, each of the churches will be doing something different, I'm sure, as far as decorating their worship spaces and that kind of thing for on-site worship. So please make sure you're checking your parish websites, your parish emails, your parish Facebook page, however they communicate with you, uh, for indications as to uh, whether there's going to be a, an opportunity for the fresh food donations, and I know many churches do every year, uh, whatever that might look like. So please make sure you're checking your, your parish websites, your parish emails, Keep an eye on that as we prepare ourselves for Thanksgiving. In the meantime, this is a week of thanks that we can uh, prepare ourselves for as we get ourselves ready for that celebration of giving thanks as mandated by Hallmark and everybody else. Uh, but it's, uh, it's our opportunity to, to truly uh, give thanks to God, a reminder, an annual reminder to, to give that extra special bit of thanks. So uh, think about that this week as you're making your way through your week. What might uh, that extra bit of Thanksgiving mean for you, particularly this year? Um, as we've made our way through this, uh, this COVID pandemic and uh, all of the changes that have happened in our world, uh, there are lots of things to lament about, but there's also lots of things to give thanks about. Um, so let's give thanks when we're able. Our closing hymn this morning is in your hymn book number 393 or in your song sheet, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
Beloved, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, press on towards the goal for the prize of our heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God. Recall that in order to be more open to God's desire for the world and for us, I'm asking that we shift the center of gravity in every congregation in the Diocese of Huron from operations to renewal and new creation. By better revealing, this will allow us to better reveal the marks of mission by becoming a learning church, just church, diverse church, and a new church. With the time remaining, I'll speak a bit about these four uh, overarching priorities for our common well-being, um, two at a time. Two, two concepts, though, uh, are important to me in this. And one of them is, it has helped me for a couple of decades almost now to see this whole enterprise of the life of the church, the life of being a Christian, as a continuing conversion. Uh, it's not a one-time conversion. It's not a, a, a really clear sometimes kind of conversion, but it is a continuing, ongoing conversion to the fullness of the gospel. Sometimes we get a bit of the truth. And as we live into it, we realize it's deeper and richer than that, and we go further and further in. It's continuing. That's one idea that's important to me and a concept I want to share and continue to talk about. And the second is the idea that... Um, uh, life isn't just thinking. Life isn't just doing. It's much more complex than that. There's a lovely and helpful term um, called habitus, that there's a habit. It's not just habits. It's more than that. There's a habitus that could be understood as sort of the MO, the modus operandi, at the heart of participation in anything, but particularly in a thing of God. So you're going to hear me talking about participation, as you already have, a fair bit. And it comes from a number of sources, but anthropologist Pierre uh, Bourdieu describes the notion of habitus as a system of lasting, transposable dispositions. They're lasting and transposable, and they're dispositions, which integrate past experiences, but function at every moment as a matrix of perception. What is your matrix of perception appreciation, and action. And he and others argue that knowing something about your habitus and living more fully into it and the many habitus that we have makes possible the achievement of infinitely diversified tasks. So something like having the same mind in you that was in Christ that I referred to earlier is to develop a deeper and richer habitus as it was in Christ. So there's a couple of concepts uh, that I think will be important um, for us. So to be open to God's desire, we aspire. I think vision, sometimes most vision statements are aspirational. We aspire to these things, and then we plan ways to try to achieve them, meet them, be drawn into them by God. So the first of these is to, we aspire to become a learning church. We have been a learning church. We have been a church that makes schools. We have been a church that takes uh, all of this very seriously. Um, but I think a new kind of learning is a place where we could shift. When, when Archbishop Rowan Williams was here speaking uh, last year, I think it was, he's speaking about discipleship. And he began his talk by saying, a disciple is a pupil of Jesus. That's the first thing, that discipleship 
is learning him, living in him, Jesus. Learning Jesus and living in Jesus is the beginning of discipleship. And learning church for me is about formation more than information. Information is helpful, it's necessary, but, but forming our lives and especially our desires and dispositions is what we can learn from Jesus. A learning church seeks spiritual transformation, spiritual growth. We talk about spiritual growth. How much do we invest in it? A spiritual formation that leads to changes in life that bear fruit in action. And this learning that I'm speaking about generally involves the joy of discovery. Uh, it deepens our fascination with the scriptures and, and Christian traditions. It leads us uh, to embrace the way of Jesus in a new way. Uh, all kinds of things come to us that we wonder, how did I miss that in my, all my years in the church? Isn't that a delight? A learning church focuses its learning on Jesus. And one of the biblical images that comes to me for this is, is God the potter? in the prophets, Jeremiah, that, that being like clay, being worked by God, we're being shaped into a particular use. It's, it's, it's a helpful, that's what I mean by learning and formation at a, in a simple image. Some possible ways to strengthen this in our life together are to invest strongly in patterns and pathways for lifelong learning. Our, our learning isn't done. If you're a disciple, you're a pupil until you meet him face to face. Lifelong learning. Education has been important to me, as many of you pro probably know, um, but you may not know why. Learning the theology, learning the Christian faith. I grew up in the Christian faith, but there was a point where I had to match the thinking and the doing and all the things that I had felt and seen and participated in, in a way that it came together. And it did came, come together for me. And then you're on to the sort of the next part of your life. I found that every time I went into formal education, which works for me, doesn't work for everybody, I found what happened was that edu idea of drawing out, it drew something out of me that I wouldn't have known was there. And more than I could have asked or imagined, frankly, in, in my life. It's also been a place of renewal. So in the midst of reading a boring passage in chapter 27 of so-and-so's uh, magnus op opus, magnus opus, what is it? They're a great big book. You're reading along and all of a sudden something happens and uh, you see things differently. It may or may not because of that, what was on that page. It becomes a place of renewal of faith and we all have different ways of finding this. We need to try them all. God will use any means necessary. I think clergy leaders model this by being learners first and teachers second. And I think every person from toddler to octogenarian or older, can be introduced to Jesus again and again. He is such a good teacher. So I'd like to see us commit more deeply of our time and resources, perhaps including investment in using uh, online and small gatherings as the core and basis for weekly formation activity across all of our churches. We cannot rely on Sunday morning to do it all. Sunday morning is the pinnacle. It's the, it's the shape of the week. Our worship together is what gives us life. God does amazing things through it, but we can't rely on Sunday alone. As we've learned, there's many possibilities. So Christian formation is a first priority to become a learning church more deeply. The second thing is uh, we aspire to become a just church. Uh, and again, I'm, say, I'm saying more, more just, or just in new ways, um, or removing some blind spots in justice. Justice in our religious tradition is um, to make right, to put right, to put something right that was wrong. The church seeks to make wrongs right uh, and to avoid injustice in the first place and to call it out when we see it and help to change it. How do we do this? Of course, we pray. Um, because we are not just ourselves. We pray uh, and then we empty ourselves of the desire to be right, to be just. We renounce our desire to turn everything to our own advantage. Then we turn to God to see what kind of justice God desires and act on it. 
And what does God's justice look like? Well, what does it look like in the lives of faithful people? We need to keep looking and watching and recognizing it. A just church prioritizes relationships and lives in right relationship with God and one another and the natural order, the creation, the earth. So we are interested primarily in what is God's justice. And this first involves God's judgment. And often we recoil from this, certainly our society does, rightly, because we don't like judgmentalism. But to judge is simply to form an opinion of something or someone and to conclude something about it. We don't like unjust, unfair, unwarranted judgment. It's judgmentalism, and that's fair. This is why justice can be tricky and difficult and elusive. Whose justice do we seek? What is the criteria that we use for judgment? Who gets to decide what is just? So we train ourselves to want God's judgment and to seek it and therefore find God's justice. And recognizing this takes a lot of interpretation, a lot of listening, a lot of wisdom, and a lot of prayer. But we do seek it, and it would be good for all. The good news that Jesus teaches us is that God has already judged us to be worthy of saving, right? We're worthy of saving and keeping and loving as unlovely as we are. And God considers that action of God justice. And the judgment saves us because the judge is just. So we cherish and seek God's justice for all. We want God to judge us. We sing like the spirituals saying, search me, Lord, find what's off and correct it, heal it, and make me an agent of your justice and reconciliation. So there's plenty of work before us. There's so many different kinds of injustice, racial injustice, economic injustice, climate injustice. We ask, what kind of God is revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? And what does Jesus teach about justice? Why is it so good to be involved in this work? This is our mission. And it didn't start with Jesus. The prophets have been on about this for a while. And Micah puts it so beautifully. What has he told you, O mortal? What is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. We seek to be a more just church. Possible ways to strengthen this? Well, to focus more strongly on Mark's mission four and five, we're actually quite active in these areas uh, to respond to human need by loving service, to seek to transform unjust structures of society, challenge violence of every kind, pursue peace and reconciliation, and to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation. And this last one is really one that in many ways undergirds all of the others, and it's the most overlooked in these generations, the integrity of creation. But there's a lot that we can do, and with tangible involvement, often led by our young members, uh, we can find some measurable goals. Carbon reduction goals would be an example of this. Um, we got to ask questions over the next while before we commit to things like, what should be our target for going carbon neutral in terms of quantities and in terms of timelines? 2045, 2030, like the Church of England has committed to? We can do it. The question is, how are we going to do it? We'll need a plan and we'll need expertise and commitment together to decide on these things. Another example of our ongoing work of God's justice is in the area of healing and reconciliation uh, in our relationship with indigenous people of this land. Indigenous Anglicans have sought this healing and reconciliation for hundreds of years. It's part of the most important and fruitful work we can be doing. And the benefits of this, again, are for all. It's time to take the work of Laic and bridge building to the next level. We need indigenous voices woven into every key decision and action. 
And in order to help with that, I'm appointing the Reverend Rosalind Elm as Archdeacon for Reconciliation and Indigenous Ministry. Like our two other bishops archdeacons, that is the Archdeacon of Huron, who's the Executive Archdeacon, Archdeacon for Congregational Development, are, are called Bishops Archdeacons. Uh, the Archdeacon for Reconciliation and Indigenous, Min Indigenous Ministry will be around the table with all the territorial archdeacons, the ones who have areas of responsibility, as the ones who share prominently in the Episcopal ministry of the bishop. We are grateful to all Indigenous Anglicans in Huron and to uh, Roz for the work that you are doing and that you are willing to fulfill this role to help us to become a just church together. I, there's no need to be overwhelmed by the many injustices of the world as much as we will need to weep and confess our sin and our complicity in them. There's no need to be overwhelmed by them because God will reconcile all things in Christ. In the meantime, we do what we can with what we have all of the time. Another reason to have hope in this area is that we already have great leadership and so many uh, human resources in our churches to make this possible. Part three, to be open to God's desire, we aspire to be a learning church, a just church, a diverse church, and a new church. A diverse church. I didn't write down where the quote came from, but it's sticking with me. Someone said, we seem to be living in a world at war with its own diversity. We seem to be living in a world at war with its own innate diversity, which of course is foolishness at its most destructive. If you wanna see the beauty that you've never seen before in our churches, then I suggest embracing multi-traditioned, multicultured, multilingual, multiracial church. There's unity only in diversity. Multi-traditioned, there, there are so many streams uh, through history and from around the world of the Christian tradition. The riches are unbearably much it's a multi-tradition. We need to know our own tradition, know who we are, and look around the world to see even just what other Anglicans are and embrace that. Multicultured. Of course, cultures are uh, not uniform. Every location has many cultures overlapping. But the richness of this, as uh, chaotic and surprising and unusual but fresh as it is, uh, will be rewarding. Multilingual. I traveled around the world and I am embarrassed when I can only really speak one language. I can read the signs maybe a little and I meet people who grew up speaking many languages. Uh, they grew, even I think their neurons and pathways grew in ways mine never could. What is it to hear your own language, whether it's an actual spoken language or something that just resonates with your soul, uh, spoken in the midst of everyone's language. And multiracial. This was a long time ago that Archbishop Desmond Tutu spoke about the rainbow people of God. Um, but that diversity being embraced is, is world changing. And Unity is only found in an embrace of diversity. When I was a kid, uh, there was no internet, uh, no video games. I had two wonderful sisters who didn't always want to play road hockey with me. Uh, at a neighborhood full of kids who were mostly older than me. So sometimes uh, I just sat on the ground and looked at whatever came along. Blades of grass, different kinds of dirt, stones, sticks, and bugs. There are a lot of different kinds of bugs, crawling things. I was amazed by this. 
all right under our feet, right under our noses. Later, I studied science, biology mainly, and it was basically because the guidance counselor said, what do you find interesting? And I said, the world? <laughs> he said, well, in biology. For you, I went and studied biology because basically it is fascinating. <laughs> then I started learning more about human beings, about social dynamics, about psychology and philosophy, and then theology. God came back into it all. And I saw that there were thousands and thousands of species of everything. And that's just on our planet. Look up at the stars at night and your imagination has to be stretched beyond its current shape to even take a bit of it in. And God made all this and God loves all this. The whole creation is almost endlessly diverse. And God loves that, apparently. But some of us seem to hate it. I know that all this difference can be overwhelming, but why don't we love it the way God does? Sin is one of the words we have for this. There are places in our tradition where you can look, and if you want to, you can find something that seems to hate diversity. Like maybe you take this, the, the story of the Tower of, of Babel, but there's also a story that goes with that, the day of Pentecost. Which two of these stories do you think makes the angels in heaven rejoice? Pentecost, when all the languages sound together in harmony and each one understood the language of each. And it was beautiful. And it was the doing of the spirit of God. We have not loved diversity enough in our churches. And I don't mean a disordered, chaotic, um, unthoughtful kind of diversity, but we are missing out, missing out on something very good. I'm a person who grew up uh, comfortably in some forms of diversity, but in other ways, I've been swimming in a sea of sameness. And it gives some predictability to my life, even if it's a bit boring. It gives me an incredible amount of security when so few have it. However, if we want more beauty and if we're going to live more fully as a just church, people like me need to be more hospitable, radically hospitable to difference and diversity. I believe that this would be good for us and good for others who may be willing to become our siblings in the gospel. So among many other things that we could do to become more diverse, one thing we could aim for would be to um, honestly begin to reorder the whiteness and Englishness without belittling it, without um, a lack of appreciation for being a child of the Church of England, but to reorder this whiteness and Englishness of our church in order to bring it more close to the diversity of the Anglican communion as a whole, at least, and closer to the demographic of our own neighborhoods, keeping those things in balance. We can all enjoy a more full expression of Anglican Christianity in our part of the world. And of course, as all the things I'm saying now, they sound more easy uh, to say than do. So we'll have our eyes and ears open to people who are not currently in our church and those who are not currently being heard within it. And I suggest that we measure progress carefully and choose to reward only those actions that bring us closer to this local, regional, global demographic. So that's three, to dive further into being a learning church and a just church and a diverse church. And finally, a new church. I have the word new in uh, quotation marks here because it's not the kind of new and improved product that you'd find for sale in a store. It's not some value added useful item that will make you feel better about yourself for a few minutes. This is the deepest, truest form of new that's possible. It's the kind of new that we hear described uh, in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, when God says, let, let there be light. And there was light. Before that, Light didn't even exist. Before that, no one had even thought of light. 
It was new. This is the new I'm talking about. God speaks and creates something out of nothing. This kind of new is also seen on the third day. For example, when Jesus was dead. Jesus was really dead, sealed up in a cave, three days dead, when you know all hope is gone. And God said, let there be life in the face of this kind of death. Get up, Jesus. You are the risen one, and there is a new creation underway. And that is what our church is built on, faith in the possibility of a new creation. When Jesus was raised up, they all wanted to embrace him and live with him in the way that they had done before he died. They wanted to cling to him and to that. But he said to them, don't cling to me, go. Go and tell my brothers and sisters what happened to tell them there is a new creation stretching out ahead of you. So church life is resurrection life. And resurrection life is a new creation. And that's the kind of new that we're going to see. God will do this. We are in a time of transformation, and a certain dying and rising will be the mystery and joy ride of our generation. And it's our opportunity to be faithful to God, who is faithful to us in this. So every decision, every grief, every opportunity, we will ask ourselves, could this be the work of God? Could this be newness? It looks like death, but maybe it's something new. Is this a possible place and moment where God's new creation takes hold? Friends of ours have two sons, and they're in their, they're in their late 20s now. But when they were little, I observed this happening. The five-year-old loved to sit on the floor in the middle of the family room on a nice big carpet with all his building blocks. And he would build castles out of these blocks. And the two-year-old loved to toddle in and knock all the buildings down and laugh. And this would happen repeatedly. And the older boy was quite patient, but of course it frustrated him. He tried to get him to stop. He tried to prevent him from coming in the room, but there were two doors. It was no use. His creations, his architectural masterpieces were just too vulnerable, too easily knocked down, too fleeting. And the younger boy earned his nickname, Kid Destructo. It makes me think of Jesus looking at the Jerusalem temple. And he taught us something. The buildings never stand for long. Ultimately, not one stone is left upon the other, even in the great temple. It's the same thing when you build roads and houses for real or in the sandbox. They stay there for a while. They look like castles, but the rains and the nights come and odd, they're washed away. Same thing happens at a beach. You make this great thing and the waves come and overnight it becomes new. Is that like the work of Kid Destructo, I ask myself, or is this an evil? Or is it the work of God, creating new heavens and new earth? We can't always tell. We in the church seem to uh, enjoy talk about things being made new, but we love the psalm, you know, uh, sing to the Lord a new song. I remember singing that in a congregation that did not like new songs. I tried to introduce a couple. All things are being made new, says Isaiah in another place. And the phrases conjure up these images of freshness and vitality, but generally, we don't really want new things. They're hard to adjust to. It would be fine if we just simply, you know, repaired and replaced, repair and replace the things that we've had. Uh, we can get new ones, they just have to be the same. We want new servers' robes, or new curtains, or new windows, but we've got to get the same as before. We want the preacher to preach about something new, but we sure don't like it when it sounds too different. We want new people, but we don't really want new ideas. We want a new way of praying, but we don't like this new song. 
No, the old one suits us just fine. And I'm as bad as anybody at this now. I'm getting worse when I get older. Nothing new is easy. In fact, all things made new is one of the most unsettling and downright controversial themes in Christian life, that all things can be made new. And inwardly, most of us long for an experience of whatever it was that was so good in the past, and more often than not, whatever it was prevents us from experiencing God today. You can't go back to whenever it was. And if you could, it wouldn't be the same because you've changed. God has moved you to a new place and God isn't done with us yet. A writer put it well, he asked, do you know what prevents you from experiencing God the most? You know what gets in the way of experiencing God the most for you? The biggest obstacle of your experiencing God is whatever your last experience of God was. I read that, I don't know the writer, but I felt so judged and so new. Your last experience, whatever it was, was so wonderful and refreshing and, and renewing that you inevitably, inevitably believe that every future experience has to be exactly like that, and it won't be. God's promise of a new heaven and a new earth doesn't seem so great when we're admiring what we've accomplished. We want to keep what we've built, these large stones of the temple, all around us. So the question becomes, and this is hard spiritual work, the question becomes, what is the temple for me? What are the temples? What is the temple for us? What's your holy temple that can't be changed? Without destroying the holy temple that God has in the midst of each of us, where God lives, what are the ones we've constructed? It might be a literal church building, but I know that there aren't many people in the church who, who dream at night about their church building. Well, there may be a few, but you know who you are. What is it that you, what is it you've built that you cherish too much? It might be those forts and dams that you fashioned as a child. It might be the special place you go to for escape, refuge, respite. Your temple might be your own job or your own business. It might be your family that you've built up and are rightly proud of and love. Every one of those temples is one day made new. And that doesn't mean that it'll simply fall. It doesn't mean that it will be destroyed even. But it's going to be made new because someday God's going to turn it into exactly what God wants it to be. Which means we lose something and we gain everything. I think that's what Jesus might have been saying when they were looking at the grandeur of that first century uh, temple in Jerusalem. It was a tremendous structure, a suitable symbol of God's greatness and glory. But Jesus knew that one day it was going to fall. And he couldn't say for sure when it would be, but he knew that there are forces at work in this world that can sweep away even something so good as this. And when it happens, it's going to seem like the end of the world. It would seem like everything his people had ever worked for would be gone. However, Jesus also knew that the temple's destruction would not mean the end of God's creation. It would not mean the end of salvation, God's creative work. So he urged people to bear suffering and newness with hope and patience. His life showed us that all of us suffer, even the Son of God suffers, and all of us go through destruction and tearing down. All of us go through death, but that's not the end. He died himself, but it was not the end. He was raised up from the dead by God's creative power, and that's newness. Both of these little boys, both the builder and Kid Destructo, are now engineers. Both of them are creative and cooperative citizens uh, who are unafraid of the open living room floor where creativity can happen. And their great joy is in the work of building and layout and construction now and the realization of completed projects. And it reminds me, the joy of church for me is, is seeing God go to work among us in the midst of a bit of a mess, visiting us with newness, even where there is emptiness, taking away some things and providing some other, and our efforts can be joined with God. Jesus was clear. The temple was destroyed, and he did build it back up in three days. But it wasn't another temple. It was himself, his body, the same Jesus who was crucified, and now he continually raises up for himself a body in the world, you and me, the church. 
So when we gather at the table and take communion, which I'm so glad that we can begin to do again, carefully. When we gather around that table and take the bread and we say the body of Christ, we're not just referring to the bread. It is placed into the open, empty hand of a human being, a person who has been made part of the body of Christ. And we say the body of Christ. So I say to you, as St. Augustine said in his own time, if then you are Christ's body and his members, it is your symbol that lies on the Lord's altar. What you receive is a symbol of yourselves. When you say amen, you're saying amen to what you are. The body of Christ, amen. Say amen to what you are and rejoice in the newness given in it. Let us pray. God of unchangeable power and eternal life, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up. Things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord.